Well, by the providence of God, our passage in our series today is about this. It's about a church coming together and moving forward as the wind of the Spirit blows us into what he has for us in the future. The passage this morning, and we are again in 1 Thessalonians, and I encourage you to go over to chapter 5. Paul, in the end of this letter, and the end of most of his letters, he talks about what we should be doing in response to what God is doing. Okay? I want you to pay attention to that pattern when you read in particular, the letters of Paul, which would be First and Second Corinthians, Ephesians, these letters. You'll see the first half talks about doctrine and talks about God and who we are. The second half is then, since God has done this, this is who he's made us, this is who he's called us to be, then this is how we are to put these things into practice. The letter of First and Second Thessalonians is the same. And so we are now in the section where Paul is just saying, okay, now do this, do this, do this, do this. And I want to encourage us as a congregation, I'm using an illustration, that each one of us would get on board, will get on these ships. And the three ships we're talking about is leadership, fellowship, and next week, we're going to talk about worship, okay? So I want you to think about us being together, and God is launching us forward. In order to launch us forward, we have to get on board. We have to get on board in a leadership capacity. We have to get on board in a fellowship capacity. And we have to get on board in a worship capacity. And then, as we are there together, we are going to set our sails and say, so God, we believe you're bringing us this way, and his spirit will empower us forward. Do you like that? Okay, this is how it works. It blows us in the direction that he's carrying us. He empowers us to what is his destination, and we're signed up for it. But in order to get there, you have to get on board, okay? Now, I've done some sailing in my past, and I've gone through some literal storms, and I know that if I'm with the ship, it'll be okay. But sometimes ships sink. Often it's from external factors that take place. Sometimes there's internal factors that will sink ships. Disease and discouragement and all of these things. And so for us to move forward, and Paul knew that as that congregation. He knows that for this congregation and any congregation... That we have to get on board and live together and set our sails. And we can destroy ourselves with disrespect and disorder and disconnection. Or we may be stuck as a congregation. We may be stuck as individuals by just putting our anchors in, right? I'm afraid, so I ain't going to go. Boom. Or our anchors of pride or laziness or whatever. In order to be blown forward as an empowered and a Godward direction as a congregation, we must get on board. And so that's what Paul is instructing the church in Thessalonica, and this is what he's instructing this church, okay? So I want you to go from a third person, this is what he's saying to them, to a first person. This is what he is saying to us. This is how to stay together. This is how to move forward. This is how to reach the destination in which God is calling us. Which is to bring about the obedience of faith. You guys remember this? Bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. That's something I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of a congregation who is together and is moving forward by God's Spirit. Don't you want to be a part of a congregation of that? I want to be a part of a congregation where people truly love one another. I want to be a part of a congregation where there's hope, where there's healing, where there's community, 
where there's love and service and sacrifice in which we praise together and God is glorified and the community and the world is impacted. Don't you want to be a part of a church like that? I say yes to that. But I know (laughs) that we can torpedo ourselves, right? By what? Grinding the old axe, right? By what? Gossiping with one another. By what? How dare they or he or she or whatever. Churches often don't explode, they implode. And yes, there are lots of dangers externally. There are waters that are difficult to navigate. There is cultural issues that are hard. And there is a supernatural enemy that wants to destroy the church. So in order for us to stay afloat, in order for us to move forward, in order for us to experience the power of the Spirit in this place, right? Let's get on board. So the first issue that Paul, by the Holy Spirit, addresses is Christian leadership. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with verse 12. Near the end of the book, he's talked to us about faith and love. He talked to us about his love for them and our love for him. He talks about all of these things, and then he comes to the end and says this. Now, we ask you, and this is NIV, by the way, brothers and sisters, I want you to personalize this today. Now, we ask you, now I ask you, now God asks you, brothers and sisters, to... Acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Now hold them in the highest regard in love. Why? Because of their work. Church leadership, you're signing up for work. You're signing up for meeting after meeting after meeting and issue after issue after issue. You are signing up to work, to serve. This is dissent. Into what God has called us to do. Descent. So what it's telling us to do, acknowledge those who, okay, so this is what we're called to do, acknowledge those, recognize those who, number one, work hard among you. This is what leaders do. They work hard among us. These people in any church Leadership team signing up to work hard. And in Christianity, the leaders serve the people. The people do not serve the leaders. Support, yes, and we all serve Christ, but we all work together, and they have some responsibilities and roles, and it is to serve you. And again, I mentioned leadership is a foundation level, right? Where you have weight put upon your shoulders, right? When's the last time you thanked your foundation of your house for being there for you all the time? We don't think about the foundation, right? Know when you think about the foundation? When there's a flood? When it's raining? When there's an earthquake? Foundation doesn't get the glamour. They're hidden. They're behind walls. They're in dirt. Things are going well, we don't think about it. When things are going poorly, we think about it. 
That is why in Scripture that God is very particular when it comes to leaders. There's all of these qualifications. And there's lists of them. Above reproach. Respectable. Able to refute bad teaching. Peaceable. Lots of things. Why? Because they have to carry a lot. Right? You want in your house your foundation blocks to be solid because if it fails, a whole lot of stuff is relying on it. And the whole house could come down. If you really want to destroy a building, you destroy the foundation and everything comes down. So these men and women who are courageous, they're signing up for work, but they're also signing up to be a target. And you will be targeted. I know in war, they aim for the person behind a microphone. They aim for a person in the cavalry that they say, I'm going to take that person out and then they'll lose direction and cohesion and it's over. Okay. Acknowledge those who work hard among you. They will work hard. And they should work hard. Second, not to belabor this, Acknowledge those who care for you in the Lord. Don't you like that? Right? One is to, to work, but also because we're getting cared for. <laughs> they care. So they pay the bills and do the budgets. They care. So they study hard. And look at doctrine and prepare for classes and preaching and teaching. They care. So they organize. <laughs> they care. So they agonize. They care. So they pray. We have a responsibility to pray for one another. You don't want people to serve you who are obligated to do so. You like being in a relationship with someone who's obligated to be in the relationship? No. Right? This is Christian leadership who care for you in the Lord. They care for your eternal souls. They're not just caring for your car, which we love our mechanics, right? They care for us in a way. They're caring for your very soul, right? which is far more valuable than your four tires, believe me. This is an amazing and awesome responsibility, so acknowledge those who are working hard, and they and we will work hard. Acknowledge those who care, and we do care deeply. Thirdly, acknowledge those who admonish you. When's the last time you used the word admonish? Never, right? We don't use admonish. Admonish, what's that? <laughs> those who tell us, <laughs> those who tell us, when we're out of bounds and say, hey, you've got to get in bounds. Those who tell us not just what we want to hear, but most importantly, what we need to hear. Those who coach us in the faith, in the faith, they have responsibility to call you out, call each other out in love on things that are not okay or not Christ-like. They have to set some boundaries, right? For your protection and the protection of others. And this must be motivated by love. Any of you guys have children? 
Anybody have children? I have children. Is raising children easy? Are there joys in it? Absolutely. So my best memories are you come home, you know, as a, as a parent, and your kids come running up to you, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. Some of our greatest joys. Some of our deepest heartaches are because of the same source. Do we have a responsibility to raise our kids? Yes. And do we have a responsibility to train them? Yes. And that sometimes there needs to be a word called D, discipline. Right? Do you like to do that as a parent? No. Do you love your kids? You do it because you love them. But you don't like it. There are times in which and I've had conversations. We have to have a conversation about something that's happening because of love. And you need to respect people to have that conversation with you. Do any of you really enjoy conflict? Anyone here enjoy conflict? I'm glad you're shaking your heads like this. Now, the lawyer is like, I do. <laughs> AJ's a lawyer, by the way. She's just joking, I know. I know AJ. <laughs> Let's go after it. But she does it because she loves her client and she loves justice. These people have a hard job. <laughs> Admonish you. And it goes on. Highly regard those in love. Highly regard those in love because of their work. They're doing this because they love this church. So love them back. Okay. This is what Scripture tells us to do. Highly regard those in love because of their work. And we are to acknowledge them. Oh, well, how do we acknowledge them? Number one, in your prayers. Right? Do you guys pray? Do you guys pray? Anyone here pray? You pray. Pray for your own family. Do it. Pray for the world. Do it. Lots of concerns. Pray for them. But also because you are a part of this congregation, okay, you need to regard those in love because of their work. You need to acknowledge them in your prayers. Take that list, and they're in the back. Pray for these people, okay? We can acknowledge them in our support. Do leaders always make wise decisions? No. Do we always, and will we always get it right? We, we won't. Try to. It takes connection. It takes support in our love. It takes some respect. Love your leaders. Right? We will do our best to love as well. So churches fail because of leadership fails. I've seen it all the time, been a part of a few, and the ship sinks because we're just not on board with that. And this is not said in a dictatorial way. This is saying because of God's grace to us and God's calling. And these folks will be swapped in and out. And we all lead in certain ways. But they have an added responsibility. Acknowledge them. Regard them. Love them. And we'll move forward. Second ship. This is Christian fellowship. And this is true of all of us. We all have the same responsibility, and it's doubly true for those in leaders, leadership. Not only are they working with numbers and solving issues, okay, but these are the things that we all too need to be doing. Paul goes on, okay, this is in leadership, and those are there uh, in the fellowship. This is how you are to regard and interact with one another. If you do so, you will go forward, Second, in fellowship, okay? And there's, again, there's a list of things that I'm trying to help us and give you hope. This is how we are to interact with one another. Doing these things, we will stay afloat. If not, we're going to sink. Shooting holes in your bo boat doesn't just sink you, but it sinks everybody. So this is what he says. Live at peace with each other. Verse 13, second part of that verse. 
live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient <laughs> with everyone. Now make sure nobody repays wrong for wrong. But always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. First, live at peace with each other. Anyone here like peace? Peace. The longer I live, the more I want it. More than all of these other things we could strive for, just to be at peace with one another. You can live in peace, or you can live in pieces. Your choice. You choose what peace you want to live in. A house divided will not stand. Now, the enemy knows he's a defeated foe, and his strategy is not for us to fight him, but to fight each other. Okay? This is how he works. Right? And if he can get a church to be fighting each other, and we have to focus in on this, that we're never looking outside the window, he wins, and we lose. Right? But if we engage him, he's a defeated foe. Which means he doesn't want to engage us, so then he'll have us engage one another and sit back and watch the show. Right? That's how it works. Right? He doesn't want us doing outreach. He doesn't want us doing missions. He doesn't want us loving one another. He doesn't want us praying. He doesn't want us worshiping together. Because if we do those things, we'll go forward and his territory will lessen and God's territory will enlarge. So we have to watch this stuff, right? And we are prone to fight one another. Thank you, Matthew. Right? We're prone to it. I remember reading a story once where a guy was on an island by himself. And he was there for quite some time, and he was finally rescued. And the ship came by, got him on board, you know, and got connected with them. And they noticed there was three huts on this island. Maybe you've heard this one, okay? So they asked him, why, is, why do you have three huts? And he says, well, the first hut, that's where I live. Okay. And the second hut is where I go to church. So then what's the third hut? Well, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> now, are there legitimate reasons to shift congregation? The answer, of course, is yes. Right? But you kind of understand that goodness. There's more people in our country and in our community that are de-churched than attend church. You know that? Why? I love God, but I don't like those people. But if the love of God is in you, he calls us to love one another. The only way you're going to reach the other side is in fellowship. Yes, you will drop Live at peace with one another. Means we have to lay down our weapons. Stop grinding our axes. Stop warring over our own wounds. Don't hold grudges. Pray, forgive, choose. Humility. Don't throw stones, but use them to build bridges. Everyone wants more peace. Everyone's been wounded in one way or the other. I took a microphone, I go around. We can talk about that, but we want to be at peace. 
live at peace with one another. And in order to do this, there's various ways in which we are to engage with one another. Pay attention to what is needed and adjust accordingly. He goes on. He says, okay, live at peace with one another. Acknowledge those who are serving us, who will work hard, who care for you, who admonish us. Live at peace, everyone. Okay? <laughs> it means we can talk about things, of course. Be at peace and then now do this. Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Now, in your Bible, it's going to have um, some different words there. Sometimes it just says idle. Sometimes it says disruptive. And so what this word means, we don't have an appropriate um, English word. What they're trying to capture is someone who is lazy, idle, and because of their not doing their responsibilities, it causes problems for everybody else. Disruptive. Disruptive. Does that make sense? For instance, you know that the tires of your car, it has a slow leak, right? But you're not dealing with it, you're not dealing with it, you're not dealing with it. And then the tire goes flat, and then it starts rotting, and you don't have money for that, and now you can't go to the place you go, and then you're late for your appointment, and you can't go to the appointment, and then it could be a health care appointment, and one thing leads to another. Doesn't it, does this make sense? It's being idle that causes disruptions for other people. I'll get to that later. And because we're being idle or lazy, okay, it causes problems for other people. Does this happen in the home? Heck yeah, right? Does it happen in your workplace? Yes. Will you just return the email? Will you just get this done? Will you clean the tool, okay? And in the church, it's a problem, right? For not being responsible or responsive, it causes problems for other people, which causes disruptions. So that means when you are giving a res- given a responsibility, do it. Warn those who are idle, which leads to being disruptive. Being called a loafer is only a compliment if you work in a bed- bread factory. I tried. I tried. Welcome to my humor, okay? (laughs) That is not humor, that's punishment, okay? Being a loafer is not a compliment, okay? Well, I'll get around to it. That's not helpful. So what Paul is saying is you have a responsibility at home, have it in in your workplace, you have a responsibility at the church, do it! Because if you don't... It's going to cause another person a problem, which causes another thing a problem, which causes another thing a problem. We just get stuck, and we can't move forward. Warn those who are idle, which causes disruption. Come on. Encourage the dishearted. Have you ever felt discouraged, anyone? If you're alive and try to accomplish anything, at some point you will feel discouraged. Know what we're called to do? Encourage one another. Encourage one another. <laughs> we are to encourage those who are timid. We are to encourage those who are worried. We're encour- we are to encourage those who are discouraged. We are to encourage those who are fearful, who feel inadequate, who are lacking in confidence, who are despondent or sad. Encourage the disheartened. Would you want to go to a church that when you came, that someone would encourage you when you came? 100%. So our conversation, this is more than uh, beyond being an acquaintance, it's being in fellowship, being connected, where you know each other's names. And yes, we're wearing name tags for a time, it won't be forever, okay? We're doing this so we can know each other's name. Why? So then we can build a relationship. Why? So we can share life. And one of the ways we do that is to encourage each other. We encourage the disheartened, not make a circle around them. Okay. This is the church. right? Help the weak. You will not always be strong. Do you have strength? Yes. Is it provided by God? Yes. At times you will be weak. 
We become at times weak physically, right? Which makes us vulnerable, which makes us not able to do what we want to. We become weak spiritually. We become weak at times emotionally. We become weak relationally. We become weak mentally. Now, instead of ignoring them, we are called to help each other up. And the world, this doesn't happen. If there's someone who's having issues at your workplace, you don't want to deal with it, you go to the other side of the office. But in the church, we can't shoot the weak, we need to restore them. Thank you. As a church, guess what? It's okay to be weak. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to be discouraged. Tell the truth. Okay. When you go to the doctor, do you sit there with the doctor? Why are you here today? I feel great. I'm here just because I want to waste my time and yours. If you don't tell the doctor what's wrong, he or she cannot help you. Tell the truth. This is not a veneer Christianity in which we, it's like our Instagram Christianity, we only post things that we want other people to see at our best moments. On that veneer, I'm telling you, there's a lot of loneliness. So what if you come together, and if you're doing great, say, I'm doing great. And what if you come together and you say, you know what, I'm really struggling with anger today. Thank you for telling me. I'm depressed, brokenhearted, and lonely. Please be honest. Our strength lies in our love from one another. It's hard to have a relationship with an image. We want the integrity to be honest. And in order to be honest, we need to be safe. In order to be safe, we need to have love. In order to have love, we need it from God. Right? Right? We do. We need it from God. God will be honored when we're honest. And we can help one another. But churches who hide from each other are just put on, everything's great. Now, if everything's great, great. Everything's great. Be great. We need you to encourage us. But Paul has to tell us all these things because we're prone to do the opposite. <laughs> we're prone to fight. We're prone to hide. We're prone to... Be lazy. We're prone to all this stuff. But God helps us in all these things. And I like this one. Be patient with everyone. Doctors are not the only people who need patience. <laughs> Trying to keep us awake today. Really? We have to put up with this. <laughs> Everyone's in development. Okay? Understand they're in development. No one's there yet. So be patient. Thank you very much. Okay. They haven't changed in seven years. How long has God waited for you at times? That was a, that was a good groaning moment right there. That was good. Well done. <laughs> He's long suffering. I ain't putting up with that anymore. Okay. Be patient with everyone. No one can move as fast as you can on some issues. Slow down. A good shepherd only goes as fast as the slowest sheep. Be patient. 
Make sure no one pays back wrong for wrong. Do you like this? If it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we'll all be sitting in darkness gumming our food. You, come, you overcome evil with what? Good. Thank you. You overcome evil with? Good. Will you be at times mistreated? Yes. Will you be at times mistreated by someone in the church? It's not a trick question. Yes! Who is this written to? Christians. One of my jobs is to remind you of things you already know. <laughs> Do not pay back wrong for wrong. Right? Make sure no one pays back wrong for wrong. How do you like that? Make sure that you don't do it, but we have to make sure for one another, right? So if you're counseling somebody in a situation, make sure that you're not encouraging them to repay back wrong for wrong. Well, they gossip about me, well, I'm going to go talk about them. They lied to me, well, I'm going to go lie to them. They didn't show up to, if this thing for me wasn't there when I needed them, so I'm not going to show up for them. Don't do that. You're doing that, you're putting holes in the boat, and we're all going to sink. Because we're all in this together. <laughs> do good. Strive to do what is good. And that's the last thing he said here. Okay? I'm going to come in for a landing. But always strive to do what is good. <laughs> you like the word strive? I don't like it. Right? It's not, hey, it's strive to do what is good. Continue to do what is good. Continue to do what is good. Continue to do what is good. For each other first. And then for everybody else. Christians should have a reputation when they, when I mention, when someone mentions it's your name, they should say, you know what? He's a good guy. He's a good woman. When I say good, there's only one that's good. I understand that. That's Christ. It's Christ in us. Hey, they work hard. Hey, they're honest. Right? The reputation of Christ in the community is reflected in those who are a part of Christ. So God, help us to do this. I am excited for our future together. How we're going to move forward is that we're together, on board, leadership, fellowship. Next week, we're going to talk about the third. You can read ahead. <laughs> Worship. We get on board. We love one another. We raise the sail. The Holy Spirit blows, empowers us to move. I'm excited to be on board with you. I am. I'm excited to see where God will take us. I am excited when God onboards some other people. I'm excited for the places that we're going to go because he is bringing us together and moving us forward. And I invite you to get on board. The Holy Spirit is inviting you to get on board. So we took some steps today, and we'll take some more steps. God is worth it, his reputation. The nations are worth it. This community is worth it. This community needs more churches of people who love one another. I believe this location is strategic, and I mean that. This, this location is pretty much in the middle of the city, give or take. Between communities of color 
and communities that lack color. Between places who have affluence and people who are struggling. There are racial divides, there are, divides, there are economic divides. There are vocational divides. There are philosophical divides. There are walls. So God is calling us to be a point of connection. Right? Cross point. That we will connect here. So we're about part of that. So embrace one another. Love one another. Pray for one another. What brings us together is greater than that which separates us. And you can say amen right there. It's the blood of Christ. And we are intentionally ending with communion. So if you have your communion elements, open it up. <clears throat> In Christ, we are one. We're one body. We're one spirit because we have one Lord and God overall. One baptism, one faith. We are one regardless of your skin color, regardless of your age, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your education, regardless of your bank account, regardless if you walked here or you drove a Mercedes here. We are one because we're in Christ. And the blood of Jesus is the great unifier. We can say amen. Our faith is a great unifier. I'm glad the kids are here. The Lord Jesus, right before he was to suffer on the cross, was gathered with his disciples. The Apostle Paul tells us these things. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, when he had given thanks, we'll do that in just a second, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So God, we give you thanks that you are the head, we are the body, and Jesus, that you took upon yourself the punishment that was due us. And in you, you have brought us together, you've redeemed us, and in us, you are glorified, and we give you praise. We thank you for what we have in you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.